Hi everyone, so you may be aware that an object moving through a fluid experiences a drag force which is approximately proportional to the object's velocity when it's going relatively slowly, but proportional to the square of its velocity when it's going more quickly. What we're going to do in this video is use some fairly simple physical arguments to gain some intuitive understanding as to why there are these two distinct regimes for the velocity dependence of the drag force. In doing so, we'll also think about how the drag force depends on other parameters like the density and viscosity of the fluid and the size of the object, and we'll also introduce the Reynolds number, which is a way of quantifying the crossover between the two different regimes. Now, because we're not actually solving the differential equations of fluid dynamics, we're not going to end up, of course, with perfectly exact solutions. However, we can do a surprisingly good job of understanding the key features of the drag force using a simplified model like the one that I've drawn out on the screen here, where we make a couple of assumptions. Firstly, that our object is just cube shaped. Secondly, that any fluid particles hitting the front face of the cube, so this one that I'm shading here, uh, are just brought to a complete stop from the perspective of the cube. And finally, that the streamlines of the particles at the very top and bottom of my diagram are completely unaffected by the presence of the cube. Um, in other words, they just keep going in straight lines rather than bending around the cube as they would do in reality. Now, I think it's easiest to understand this system from the perspective of the rest frame of the cube. In other words, we're going to imagine that the cube is stationary and the fluid is flowing to the right with some velocity. Let's say that the velocity um, is u, but note that this is completely physically equivalent to the cube moving to the left with a constant velocity of u um, in a stationary fluid. Now, ultimately, there are two effects which are contributing to the drag force on our cube, represented by the two red arrows that I've just drawn onto my diagram. Those are representing two different types of force. So we've got this one down here, um, which I'm going to label as Fi, meaning inertial force. The physical origin of that force is just uh, the bombardment of the front face of the cube by all of these fluid particles, right? Those fluid particles are coming in. We're assuming that their velocity is being reduced from u down to zero, by the surface of the cube, and therefore the cube must be exerting a leftwards force on those fluid particles. Then by Newton's third law, the fluid particles must be exerting a rightwards force on the surface of the cube. We call it the inertial force simply because it arises from the inertia of the fluid, right? The inertia of the fluid means its, its tendency is to keep going to the right with a constant velocity of u, but we're stopping that from happening. And to do that, we need um, this force to be applied. The second force that I've drawn on my diagram, this one up here, um, is essentially a frictional force. And the origin is, imagine that the particles moving along this streamline that's just sort of coming past the top face of the cube. As those particles move past the cube, they are going to be brushing against its surface and through friction, they're sort of tending to pull the cube to the right. Now that effect we call viscosity. And so I'm going to label this as FV for viscous force. I've also just added some Cartesian axes so that we can talk unambiguously about the various directions involved here. So let's come up with expressions for FI, the inertial force, and FV, the viscous force, starting with the inertial contribution. So FI, where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from Newton's second law, ultimately, which says that force is rate of change of momentum. So I'm going to say the inertial force is dP by dt, but I'm going to give that momentum p a little subscript of x just to emphasize that it's due to particles moving in the x direction and coming to a stop in the x direction. At this point, I'm going to switch to using little squiggly lines like this to show that we're no longer being exact. Let's think about how we're going to rewrite our dpx by dt, which is rate of change of momentum. So what you have to imagine is that the fluid particles are coming in, hitting the surface, having their velocity reduced from u down to zero over some infinitesimally short time scale, which is the dt in that derivative there. So we'll start by just keeping that dt in the denominator. Now, change in momentum is going to be mass times change in velocity. We'll imagine splitting up the fluid into fluid elements, infinitesimally small fluid elements. Those fluid elements don't change their mass when they hit the surface, which is why it's okay to just say it's mass times change in velocity. Let's call the mass of a fluid element dm put the d there because it's an infinitesimally small element. Um, it's having its velocity reduced from u to zero, and so its change in velocity is zero minus u. But so far, this is the force on the fluid element. So we need to use Newton's third law to find the force on the surface, which just involves putting a minus sign um, in front there. And this, of course, simplifies to just u 
times dm by dt. The question then becomes, what are we going to do about the dm? And the interpretation of dm is the mass of fluid which hits the surface and is brought to rest in that infinitesimally short time dt. So I've just added to my diagram a sort of imaginary box showing all of the fluid which is going to come into contact with the cube's surface within time dt. What are the dimensions of that box? Well, let's just say that the cross-sectional area of the cube is a, that's going to be another parameter of our problem, and therefore uh, our little box here has a cross-sectional area a as well. Then we can just use uh, speed as distance over time to work out the horizontal extent of that box, right? So the, uh, the distance traveled by the furthest particle back, which is still going to hit the surface in time dt, is just the speed of its flow, which is u multiplied by the time interval dt. How do we incorporate that into our u dm by dt equation? Well, let's start by writing dm as the density of the fluid multiplied by um, the volume of that box of stuff which is going to hit the surface in time dt. So rho dv by dt. Again, dv because it's infinitesimally small. Um, but we know the dimensions of the box, so we can keep the u rho, but we can write dv as the cross-sectional area multiplied by the extent in the x direction, which is u dt. And that whole thing is divided by dt. Then conveniently, the dt's cancel and we can combine the u's into a u squared. So this whole thing is just approximately proportional to rho a u squared. So there's our approximate expression for that inertial force contribution. Now we have to think about the viscous forces. So I need to start by telling you a couple of things about firstly how viscosity is defined um, and then also how the presence of viscosity affects the um, velocity of flow of the fluid around an object. First thing you need to know is that because viscosity is essentially a frictional force, the effect it has on the fluid that the object is immediately in contact with is to eliminate any relative motion between the fluid and the object. In other words, the fluid molecules that are just right above the surface of the cube are not going to be moving at all relative to that cube. What actually happens is you get a velocity gradient as you go further and further away from the surface, right? So um, the, the fluid that's in contact with the top surface of the cube and not moving, you go up a little bit um, and the velocity starts increasing. The further up you go, the bigger the velocity of the fluid gets until it reaches the bulk flow velocity, which is that u, at which point it's not going to be changing anymore, right? So you get this thing called a boundary layer, which is this region here um, where the, uh, the fluid is not actually moving relative to the object and it sort of gradually has to build up to the bulk velocity. So next you have to imagine drawing an imaginary surface in the fluid like this, which has the same shape as the top face of the cube, but it's just sort of displaced upwards a little bit, right? So the, in this small diagram that I've drawn here, the, um, uh, the rectangle at the bottom is the top face of the cube, but the one that I've just added is like an imaginary surface within the fluid above that top surface. Now think about what the fluid molecules, the fluid particles within that imaginary surface are going to do over some short time dt they're just going to move to the right, right? So if you look at this a short time later, this surface will have just displaced to the right by some amount, depending on the flow velocity. It's important to note that this is only happening because of the fact that there's this velocity gradient, right? And therefore layers of fluid further up um, are traveling to the right faster than layers of fluid uh, further down. Now, how do we quantify that displacement? Well, let's say there is a displacement of dx in the x direction, right? So the top layer has moved by dx relative to the bottom one in some short time dt. Uh, and let's say that the vertical displacement between them, which is not changing over time, um, is dy. A nice way of saying all this would be that a shear strain has been set up within the fluid. And by definition, the shear strain is the horizontal displacement over the vertical displacement, dx by dy. Now for many fluids called Newtonian fluids, it's observed that the shear stress at any point um, in the fluid is proportional to the rate of change over time of the shear strain. So I've written this as a proportionality, but the viscosity of the liquid is defined such that it's the constant of proportionality between these two constants. I'm going to call my viscosity eta, and so here is a definition of the, the viscosity parameter. So how does this help us? Well, the shear stress by definition is the force acting in a particular plane divided by the area of that plane. And in this case, the shear stress, the force which is causing the shear stress is the viscous force, right? So the shear stress is going to be the viscous force Fv divided by the area of the top face, which because it's a cube is the same as the front face we considered before, um, which is just A. 
So this is about, and by the way, note that this is not equal. I used an equality on the previous line because this is generally um, true. But here, remember, we're making assumptions about the, um, the flow pattern of the fluid. So this is now becoming approximate. But we can say this is approximately the viscosity of the fluid multiplied by d by dt of the shear strain, which we argued earlier is just dx by dy, um, as defined in that little diagram that I drew. But then you can take the time derivative and say that, well, dx by dt is just the velocity um, in the x direction, which I'm going to call v. And I'm going to say this is then eta um, times dv by dy. Note that I'm not saying u, even though the flow velocity uh, we said earlier was u. The reason for that is that the flow velocity is not always u, right? We said that it increases from zero up to u over this little layer, um, which is next to the object. So v is more general. We say that v increases from zero to u as you move further and further um, away from the object. So this, of course, implies that the viscous force is proportional to, well, this is multiplied both sides by the area, so eta times a. Now, what are we going to do about that velocity gradient dv by dy? Well, dv we can imagine as like a change in velocity as you move upwards. And we've just said that the velocity increases from zero up to u. And so let's say dv is just u. The question is over what length scale does it, does it happen, right? Over what length scale does the velocity increase from uh, zero up to u? Well, firstly, let's define another parameter of our cube. Let's say that it has a side length, which I'm just going to call capital D. And then the argument goes, well, d sets the length scale for the problem, right? Essentially, what we mean by that is it would be kind of strange, uh, just intuitively speaking, if you had an object of size d, and you looked at the velocity gradient of the fluid around the object, and you found that the velocity increases from zero to u over a length scale 100 times bigger than d, for example, right? You wouldn't expect intuitively the object to be affecting the flow of the fluid 100 times further away than its own size. So we're going to say that the length scale for variation um, of the velocity in the fluid is approximately d. Again, this is very approximate, but it seems like a physically reasonable thing to do to say that the object affects the fluid on a length scale similar to its own size. Now, all you have to do is remember that, well, it's just a cube, and so a is d squared, and so this viscous force is approximately eta times d times u. Now, of course, we've got both of these forces acting, and so the most general drag force we would expect to take the following form, um, it's going to be some constant times the inertial force, so alpha, let's say, times rho a u squared, plus some other constant, which we don't know, let's say beta, times um, the viscous force, eta du, where alpha and beta are sort of constants which we can't possibly figure out using the simple analysis that we've done, but these constants would depend on, um, for example, the specific shape that our object has. So at this point, it would be appropriate to define this thing I mentioned at the beginning called the Reynolds number, which we just usually call RE. This is simply the ratio of the two terms in the drag force to each other, um, neglecting the prefactors alpha and beta, right? Because those are very geometry dependent. So we're just going to take the first term, which is proportional to rho a u squared, divided by the second term, which is proportional to eta du, right? Notice that one of the u's cancels from the top and the bottom. So you're gonna have a single factor of u on the top. You're gonna have a row on the top as well. A divided by d is area divided by side length, which is just the side length. So you've got a d on the top as well, and you're left with your viscosity on the denominator. And this is the simplified version of the Reynolds number. So what's the point of the Reynolds number? Well, it tells you about the transition between the two regimes we talked about right at the beginning um, of how the drag force depends on velocity. So let's start by considering the extreme case where the Reynolds number is huge. It's much bigger than one. What does that actually mean? Well, it means the numerator of the Reynolds number is much bigger than the denominator. But the numerator came from the first term, the inertial term in the drag force, right? So if RE is much bigger than one, that means the first term in the drag force dominates. You can ignore the second one, and the drag force is then um, approximately proportional to the square of the velocity, which is consistent with what we said right at the beginning, where at high speeds, um, the drag is typically proportional to the square of the velocity, but we've just made that statement a bit more precise now in terms of what we actually mean by high speed. It means that this quantity here is much bigger than one. The opposite extreme limit, of course, is when RE is much less than one. In that case, the denominator would be much bigger than the numerator, but the denominator came from the viscous term, the second term in the drag force. And so if we ignore the first term in the drag force, we just get that F drag is proportional approximately to U. And so not only have we justified 
why these two regimes have the specific velocity dependencies that they do, but we've also um, understood where the transition occurs between those two different regimes. So I think that's about all I have to say on this topic. I always find this kind of thing very useful because it's one thing to be able to solve differential equations and do difficult maths, but it's another thing to be able to actually understand the meaning of your solutions. And I think this kind of um, simplified physical model can be very helpful with that sort of thing. So thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.